scripture reading this evening will come from Judges chapter 11, verses 29 through 32. Judges chapter 11, verses 29 through 32. I'll be reading from the ESV. <clears throat> then the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead he passed on to the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord, and said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. Good evening to all of you. We're certainly grateful to see all of you this evening. Grateful for the opportunity to come together at the 5 o'clock hour and worship God once again. We're thankful to those who have led us in our worship up to this point and uh, grateful as has already been mentioned uh, many of our last leaders group have returned and back with us and we certainly give God the thanks for their safe travels back to us and not just from the lads group but others who were away visiting with family for Easter this morning and certainly we're thankful that you're back with us if you would like you can leave your Bible open to Judges chapter 11 uh, most of our study will come from Judges chapter 11. We will uh, notice some other scripture to help uh, uh, get an understanding of what's going on with Jephthah's vow in Judges chapter 11. But uh, most, most of our study will come right here. Let's go ahead and begin where Preston just read for us a moment ago, a text that you're very familiar with, verses 29 through 32, where Jephthah... Jephthah makes this, uh, this vow to God. And um, if you have a, script, a reference Bible or a study Bible, it might uh, have the heading Jephthah's foolish vow or Jephthah's rash vow or something like that. And we want to discuss this evening, this vow that he made, verse 30. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. He's making this vow to the Lord. And this, of course, came up in our Wednesday night Bible class a couple of weeks ago piqued interest and uh, wanted to go into it a little more tonight with Jephthah's vow that uh, he has here presented to the Lord, verses 29 through 32. Now there's a lot of questions that will come up that we'll try to answer when it comes to this vow that Jeph Jephthah made. Did he have the right to do so? And did he have the right to carry it out? And did he carry it out in the way that is commonly um, uh, said that he carried out? Uh, this vow. So that's kind of where we're going this evening. Remember, in the period of the judges, uh, you have this continual cycle. Joshua was the leader prior to this period, but Joshua has lived his life and he has now uh, went the way of all the earth and he's no longer. And you're in this new period of time between the kings where uh, God was in control. And that's what they needed to realize and understand, just to let God continue to be in control. But they would leave God and they would enter into sin. As a, as a nation of people, they would, they would get so consumed in sin that God had to give them up and he would allow some foreign nation, usually the Philistines, that's common in this book, such as with the judge Samson, to, to come and to, to um, take them over in, in captivity. And then a judge would rise up to lead the people out of this captivity. But let's notice Jephthah's daughter. Let's begin our study together with Jephthah's daughter, verses 34 through 40, as we'll read together. And the question must be asked when it comes to Jephthah's daughter, because you remember that here you are, you have Je Jephthah making this vow to the Lord, and he said in verse 30, again, made the vow to the Lord, if you'll deliver them whatever comes out of my doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the people of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Now that's going to be key as we move forward. But the question does have to be asked because there are two different uh, lines here of thought and opinion on if she was actually sacrificed or not. And what I would like to do is present the reason behind each opinion on if she was actually sacrificed or not. But ultimately, the lesson isn't about that. The lesson is about Jephthah and the mistakes 
that he made throughout this vow. Judges chapter 11, beginning in verse 34. When Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, there was his daughter. So he just made the vow earlier, of course, in this chapter. And we saw that I will offer it as a burnt offering. When he came to his house at Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and dancing. And she was his only child. Now, there's some key words that we need to focus on as we go throughout this study in Judges chapter 11. One, Jephthah said, I'm going to offer whatever comes out as a burnt offering. Second, we see that his daughter comes out. She is what comes out. And third, the Bible specifically tells her that she was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. Verse 34. And it came to pass when he saw her that he tore his clothes and he said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. Notice here how he is going into the blame game. We talk about that quite often, do we not? Started with Adam blaming Eve, blaming uh, even perhaps God. And we see it in the days of Saul the king, blaming the other people. Notice Jephthah, he's, he's shifting the blame to his daughter. You have brought me very low. She didn't do anything. She didn't do anything wrong. It was, it was his vow. He's the one who made the vow. He said, you are among those who trouble me. For I have given my word to the Lord and I cannot go back on it. So she said to him in verse 36, My father, if you have given your word to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, because the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the people of Ammon. Then she said to her father, verse 37, let this thing be done for me. Let me alone for two months that I may go and wander on the mountains and be well my virginity, my friends and I. So he said, go. And he sent her away for two months. And she went with her friends and bewailed her virginity on the mountains. In verse 39, and it was so at the end of two months that she returned to her father and he carried out his vow with which he had vowed. Now remember the vow First thing that comes out of my house, I'm going to offer as a burnt offering. She goes away for two months and he comes back and he carries out the vow. She knew no man. Notice that's another key. At the end of two months, she returned to her father. Her father carried out the vow which he had vowed and she knew no man. And it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went out four days each year to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite. So, the question... If you were to uh, spend a little time in studying and spend a little time reading what has been written through the years or listening to what people have said about this through the years, the question would be, well, did she die? Did he offer her as a burnt offering? Or was she given to the continual service of the Lord in the tabernacle service? Again, I'm just going to present to you the opinions there and reasons for each and see where you land with what the Bible reveals to us. First, the text seems clear that Jephthah did not have his daughter in mind when he made this vow. When he thinks about offering a burnt offering, when he says the first thing that would come out, verses 35 and 31, it seems clear that he did not have his daughter in mind. It's possible, at least, according to some, that he dedicated her to the service of the tabernacle rather than actually offering her as a burnt offering. Open your Bible, put your ribbon marker there, Judges chapter 11. Judges chapter 11, put it there because we're going to go back to it. But I want to again just present a couple of thoughts to you for you to consider. Open first of all to the book of Luke chapter 2 and verse 36. Luke chapter 2 and verse 36 beginning. In the book of Luke chapter 2, when Jesus was being presented on the eighth day, now there was one Anna, a prophetess of the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. 
So same here, you have a woman that uh, some would use as their text to go to is one who had been dedicated to the temple service and not leaving it for any reason. Now go back to the book of Exodus chapter 38 and verse 8. Old Testament book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible. Genesis and then Exodus, Exodus chapter 38 and verse 8. And given the instructions for the commands and the tabernacle and all that went in the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 38 and verse 8 he made the laver of bronze and this base of bronze from the bronze mirrors of the serving women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting the serving women some would say well Jephthah made this vow it was a foolish vow but he could keep his vow by letting her become one of these women who served at the tabernacle continually, kind of like Anna. Also remember 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 22. If you go to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 22. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 22. Now Eli was very old and he heard everything his sons did to all Israel and how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Again, if you're towards the mindset, okay, if Jephthah was able to keep his vow and giving his daughter in the service of the Lord, then perhaps she could fall into this, and this seems to be who Eli's sons were lying with, these women who had been dedicated to the service of the Lord. If you go back to our text in Judges chapter 11, verses 37 and 38, further argument for this point would be that she lamented her virginity and not her death. In Judges chapter 11, verses 37 and 38, And ultimately, the Bible said that she was his only child, not just only daughter, but only child, so she would not leave a family legacy to Jephthah, no offspring. That was was very important. Heritage was very important to the people of Israel, as you know. And now Jephthah's line would end. So here's some questions that I would present If death, if Jephthah did offer her as a burnt offering, then why delay the vow for two months? And why not two years? Why not allow her to have children and offer her? I don't know. I'm just presenting something for you to think about. If tabernacle service, why is there no mention of her like there is when Hannah would go and see Samuel? You remember in 1 Samuel, Hannah is begging, pouring out her soul before the Lord, asking for a male child. And she makes a vow. And we're going to read that in just a moment. If you give me a male child, I'll give him back to you. But then the Bible then tells us about Hannah going to see her son, the tabernacle. So it's interesting to me that if it was tabernacle service, why are we not given any more information about her in the tabernacle as we were with Hannah and Samuel. Also, go to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. If this vow was able to be accomplished through tabernacle service, and then eventually, of course, what becomes the temple, but if it's able to be accomplished through tabernacle service, is there anything that says that she could not get married or have children? That would be one of my questions. I do not know where the word of God says that she could not get married or have children. You remember again, Samuel was given to the tabernacle service because of his mother's vow. 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 11, then she, that's Hannah, Hannah made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And she does. She reached, in this vow, she gives 
She gives Samuel to the Lord and she, when she weans him. And then you remember 1 Samuel chapters 3 and 4. He is there in the tabernacle or he's there with Eli. And he hears the Lord speaking to him. And so she gives him to the Lord. But you remember what one of the problems was when you get into 1 Samuel chapter 8. Samuel was old, but your sons do not walk in your ways. They do not walk in the same integrity that you walk. So we have here one who was given by a vow by his mother to the, the dedication to tabernacle service. But yet he still had children. So that's, again, some areas to consider. Again, that's going to be your two main opinions on this vow that Jephthah made. It's not necessarily the point of our lesson, the main point of our lesson. But it is something to consider to let you know a little of those who are on either side. As for me, I'm in the camp of she was sacrificed, if you're wondering. I'm in the camp that Jephthah carried out a human sacrifice because he said he was going to offer whatever came out as a burnt offering. That's, that's, my, that's my opinion. Uh, it may or may not be your opinion, but I will say this. There's a valuable lesson to learn here. Inspiration does not mean, when we talk about the Bible being inspired by God, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, not everything in it is God giving us and telling us what to do. There is that, obviously, and God telling us what to do. And like, for example, with the tabernacle and how to build the tabernacle and in the New Testament and how to worship. Inspiration also is that of just God revealing to us what happened. And, and, and here's an example of he did offer her as a human sacrifice. And as we're going to see with our next point, it does not mean that God required it at all. And that's important that we realize that. If Jephthah does offer her as a sacrifice, God did not require it. But if we're not careful, again, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, I'm just going to open the Bible and whatever the Bible says to do, I'm going to do it. Understand what can happen with that. If you just happen to open your Bible to Judges chapter 11, and here's a man that made a vow to the Lord, and then seemingly, in my opinion, offered his daughter as a human sacrifice, are we going to turn around and say, well, that's Bible, let's do it? Certainly not. Did God require this from Jephthah? Absolutely not. Inspiration is just revealing the facts as they happen. Now, again, yes, some of it is the, the commands that God gives us and how to be faithful to him. But some of it is the lives of these people as example for areas to follow and areas not to follow. Now go to Judges chapter 11 and verse 30. Let's move on with Jephthah's problem. So that was... I knew it was going to take 10 minutes or so, 10 to 15 minutes to cover, but I thought it was important to include that with the lesson. But now I want to get into the heart of the sermon. Judges chapter 11, verse 30, beginning. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, there again, that whatever. He was not expecting it to be his daughter. When I return in peace from the people of Ammon, surely... Be the, will surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. First of all, Jephthah did not have to make a vow to the Lord. And we know that the Old Testament, of course, restricted it a number of times. In the law of Moses, it restricted vows, and it at the least caused people to think about what they were doing if they did make a vow in the Old Testament. He did not think about the consequences of the vow when making it. And quite often, we might not be making vows to God, but whatever it is in our day-to-day -day life, whether it's our relationship with God or with one another, and, and everything that we do, whether personally or with one another, God is always involved. That's something we need to remember. From Jephthah, we learn that we need to stop and think about the consequences. What are the consequences? I need to think this out on what I am saying that I will do. You know, whether I perhaps personally say it to God or if I say it to one another. What are the, am I ready 
to fulfill what I'm saying that I will do. Jephthah did not have to make this vow to God. Jephthah, as we've already mentioned, did not expect his daughter to come out of the house. But have you ever thought about this? What if his daughter would not have been the first to come out of the house? What if it would have been an animal, but an animal that was not worthy of sacrifice? You see, Jephthah has not really stopped to think about any of this when you go back and read the law God was very specific about what could and could not be sacrificed to him and he rejected that when you get into the minor prophets I think it's the book of Malachi that God specifically condemns them for basically giving him the leftovers and that's what he says to them in Malachi. He's like, would you offer to your governor what you're offering to me? You would give the very best to your leaders of the land, and you're giving me the leftover. God has never accepted leftovers. Never has he accepted leftovers. So when Jephthah makes this vow, what if an animal walks out, but not one worthy of sacrifice? Then what does Jephthah do? You see, we need to stop it think before making these rash comments if he did offer his daughter as a human sacrifice then at this point he is definitely disobeying God even if that was his plans in the beginning here's a time when he should not have went through with what he said he would do sometimes we say we will do stuff whatever it might be and then we need to stop and think. If it's sinful, I need not carry this out. Now, I might have to humble myself. I might, I might promise you something, and then I stop and think about it. I think, no, I, actually, I can't do this. Then I have a decision to make. Okay, am I going to do this because I gave you my word that I would do it? Or am I going to humble myself? Am I going to crawl to you, and I'm going to say, you know what? I'm wrong. I'm sorry. I told you I would do something. I gave you my word that I would do something without really processing it. And I can't do this because it would be sinful. So I'm going to have to ask you to forgive me for, for, for making a, a promise that I can't fulfill because I can't go against God. Leave your ribbon marker in Judges 11. Go back to the book of Leviticus chapter 18. We're going to spend a little time in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy. Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 21. Let's notice together. Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 21. You shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire of Molech, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Now, remember that human sacrifices were common throughout this time. And the people of Israel had been influenced by the nations around them. And not any human sacrifice, of course, is unbearable to think about. But remember, that which was common, especially with one of the nations round about, was children. The human child sacrifice. So a number of times in the law, God would directly prohibit such. Someone might say, well, what about Abraham? He never sacrificed Isaac. God was testing Abraham, but a ram was there instead. In Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 1 beginning. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 1 beginning. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Again you shall say to the children of Israel, 
Whoever of the children of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in Israel who gives any of his descendants to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. Now this, this is punishment for these sacrifices. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I will set my face against that man. I will cut him off from his people because he has given some of his descendants to Molech, again, the children's sacrifice, to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. So God would not want Jephthah to carry this out. This is when Jephthah would need to humble himself and repent. Now go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 12. Deuteronomy chapter 12. And notice verse 29 beginning. Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 29 beginning. When the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispose, and you displace them and dwell in their land, take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them. Remember, that's a common problem with the people of Israel. They're wanting to keep what they picked up in Egypt with them and their idol gods. And they're also, as they're getting into these new lands, they're wanting to, to take what they're seeing in these new lands with these new people. And they're wanting, to, uh, they're wanting to adopt that. But God's telling them, don't do it. Verse 30, take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you. And that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? I also will do likewise, even though they do, of course. In verse 31, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abomination to the Lord which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Ruthless, evil people. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 10. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 10. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft or soothsayer, or who interprets omens or sorcerer. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 10. So here's the point. If Jephthah did offer her as a human sacrifice, it was not pleasing to God. Because God has already laid it out a number of times in the law to not do this. But I want us to notice how what Jephthah did, we see the same problems today. You see similar problems today. In the book of Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, Hosea said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. Think about Jephthah. Let's go back and think about this. Insert yourself into the text. If Jephthah would have stopped for a moment, if he would have considered the law, first of all, if he would have considered what the law said about vowing, secondly, if he would have considered what the law said about sacrificing, and then if he would have stopped and thought on this for a moment before speaking to the Lord. But the same can be true today. If we would stop and think about what does the word of God have to say in this matter, then we might not find ourselves in situations like Jephthah. Like Jephthah and the people in Hosea's day, many today do not study to know what God requires of them and does not require of them. There's much confusion and worry and error and stress in the world simply because we're not spending enough time reading the Bible not going after the counsel of God. And it's not until we read and study God's word on a regular basis so we can become so familiar with it that we can know what God would have us to do in these situations. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. So the greatest point that I take from Jephthah's vow is Jephthah did not consider God he did not consider the one eternal God, creator of the world, that he was vowing to. He, he did not consider that at all. He did not consider God's word at all. And the same problems can come up today when we do not consider God's word. Now in closing, we must see where Jephthah is mentioned in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 11 
in verse 32. As you know, the Hebrews writer in Hebrews chapter 11 is going through a long list of names. And some of these names, we have no trouble. Abel, Noah, Moses, Abraham. We have no trouble. But let me ask you this. Which one was sinless? Which one in Hebrews chapter 11 never sinned? You see, we have no trouble with Abel and Moses and Noah and Abraham being listed in the great Hall of Faith chapter because the good that we know about them outweighs the bad that we know about them. That's what, that's what I believe. That, that, I think that's what it boils down to. The good that we know about them outweighs the bad that we know about them. But in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32, What more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak, Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. We don't have a problem with David. The good outweighs the bad. Samuel, certainly not. Most everything we read about him is good. But when we read about people like Samson, he's in that chapter of faith. Rahab, the harlot, she's in that chapter of faith. The issue there is the bad outweighs the good. But again, none of these including Abraham, Moses, and Noah, were sinlessly perfect. How is it that Jephthah is mentioned by the Hebrews writer as an example, a, a staple of faith to follow? When we know what we know about him from Judges chapter 11. At the least, he made a rash vow without considering the word of God. It's possible that he slaughtered his daughter as a human sacrifice. But what we must understand is this is not a blanket endorsement of everything that Jephthah did. Just like the faith of Abel and Noah and Moses and Abraham, it's not a blanket endorsement of everything they did. Abraham and his faith is commended over and over and over throughout the New Testament. It's not a blanket endorsement from the times that Abraham we know sinned and lied about his wife Sarah. Certainly God was not pleased with that. But the Hebrews writer and elsewhere, James 2, Abraham and Rahab, for example, can use an example of faith to show how this is an area of their life that you follow. In your life, for example, you have faith. That's why you're here at 5 o'clock on a Sunday night. It doesn't mean that you're perfect. It doesn't mean that you're sinless. But yet there is that faith in your life that we're hoping other people are noticing your family, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers. And we're hoping that they notice that, hey, every Sunday, not just Easter, every Sunday, they're not home. They must be at church. So while we're not sinlessly perfect, there is that which is strong faith that we hope other people in the community recognize. And for Jephthah, he did do that which is good when he went out as a leader to free his people. Sometimes, again, even with this vow, people make the wrong decisions. But God can even use bad decisions to work that which was good. Jephthah's vow, let's stop and think before we make promises, especially to God if you do that but certainly to one another. Think about what could the consequences be. Let's humble ourselves. We learn from the life of Jephthah that if I'm in the wrong, I need to humble myself and I need to come to you and I need to come before God and say, I'm here to repent. I made the wrong decision. Let's focus on that which we can do that is right and strive to be godly. That which 
someone like the Hebrews writer can say, here's an area of his faith, of her faith, that was right. Jason has a song selected for us to sing together, one to another in just a moment. We're going to stand and sing to God and to one another, it's a, time, a time of encouragement. And we want you to consider your life and consider where you are currently. Are you in a relationship with God that if the Lord were to return this very night, would you say, I'm ready to go to heaven based upon the scripture? If not, don't leave this building until you are. Let us help you in whatever ways that you need to change your life. To make it right with God. Either putting on Christ in baptism or returning as a baptized believer to become faithful once again. If there's anything that we can do to help you to go to heaven, please come as we stand and as we sing.